Welcome. I'm Elaine Borsett. I'm the president of the Electric Vehicle Association of San Diego, where our goal is to educate and advocate for the rapid adoption of electric vehicles. We're excited to have Ricky Roy of 2-Bit Da Vinci with us. His YouTube channel is all about tech, energy, and transportation. It has over 100,000 subscribers. Be sure to check it out. Yeah, Ricky. thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I actually, uh, I first met Elaine, I think I might have met a couple other of you guys at the San Diego Auto Show. Um, I did a little booth there and kind of talked to people about uh, their questions about EVs. And I think part of what I love about this organization is the, you know, the advocacy is, is important. I think people have a lot of ideas or questions or fears, misconceptions, and um, there's nothing like just letting somebody like drive your car or just kind of like put their mind to rest. So great organization and thank you Elaine for that introduction um yeah my name is Ricky I I part-time I, I run a YouTube channel called Tupa Da Vinci and uh yeah we talk about the future of technology energy and transportation I think it's one of those things that I've always been really passionate about now I remember at university my engineering like final project was this kind of rechargeable uh battery-powered motorcycle and stuff and so I, I've always kind of been into this sort of stuff and uh, Robert, who's on the call, actually, I met in Austin for Fully Charged, actually built one. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on. And I wanted to talk about how solid state batteries are kind of this breaking point for EVs, I think. And I think their, their arrival or their adoption is, is what a lot of companies are waiting on. And, uh, and other people have said, you know what, we're not going to wait. We're going to go ahead and get started. But that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, you want to, next slide. So the lithium ion battery of today has like pretty drastically revolutionized our world. You can imagine how different we all might be living if it wasn't for cell phones that last all day and laptops that last 10, 12 hours. And all this is kind of made possible with some of the, the great work of uh, John B. Goodenough and, and his colleagues and the people of Sony who, who made the first uh, product, uh, production versions of the cell. And um, you know they had far greater energy density than older batteries like nickel cadmium or lead acid. And they've, they've really kind of changed the world. Next slide. And, and some people were crazy enough to see this little cell and think, I know, I'll strap 4,000 together and build an electric vehicle, right? Uh, click one time. Companies like Tesla and GM, there's, there's, there's others like the EV1, which was a lead acid, but people thought, well, we can build a car today. And that was probably one of those decisions that a lot of people didn't make that connection, thinking, I know what this is. And you're saying if I solder 4,000 of these together in series in parallel, that we can build a car. And today, right now, there are some, some of the best cars you can buy today probably are Tesla's offering. And uh, it's completely viable today. Next slide. So today's battery, we have some basic components and I'll, I'll be quick because I want to have time for conversations at the end. We have the anode, which is the negative side, the cathode. There's a separator to keep the two from touching and short circuiting. And then there's this electrolyte. Today, we have this liquid electrolyte, this gel that allows ion transfer between the anode and the cathode. So there's, I'll, I'll get into why it's liquid today, but, and then there's current collectors at the very end that where all the current is collected and we have the positive and negative terminals. Next slide. The problem is with this gel, this liquid electrolyte. And the problems are many. Uh, for starters, it's very temp temperature sensitive. It's flammable. So, you know, if you've ever seen like a battery fire, that's the culprit. It's the liquid, very flammable uh, solution. And it takes the volume and weight without really adding any density. And uh, it has, it kind of is the impediment to further development. It is kind of a limiting factor for ion transfer. So like, and, and the fact that it gets hot requ requires cooling, which kind of limits how fast you can pull out of it or put energy back into it. And uh, there's, there's one of the main challenges is the formation of dendrites, which I have a little video at the end, but dendrites are little whiskers of lithium that form. And if they grow long enough, they can actually rupture the separator and cause all sorts of bad things. So these are all the drawbacks that we've all dealt with, um, with lithium ion batteries. And again, we've come so far, the chemistry has gotten a lot safer and better, but this is one of those limits that really there's probably no getting over unless you make the next evolutionary jump. Next slide. Okay. 
So, uh, Elaine, I don't know if you want to unmute. There's actually, we don't need the audio, but you can go ahead and play this video. This is a video from the University of Michigan, their engineering department, and they have a great glass opening into one of their batteries, and they show how these dendrites kind of form as the batteries charge and discharge, and these ions pass through. You can probably stop it here. The, in the slide, you can you can have the full link and the full reference, but you can go ahead and click maybe to stop it. I forget. There's the uh, link. Can you click again? I think that might advance the slide. What did you say, Ricky? I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, let's go ahead and skip the rest of this. Okay. All right. Good deal. Yeah. So. Um, the solution, uh, it's been on our horizon for a while, it's tricky, it is a solid state battery. Um, when we went from hard drives to solid state hard drives, there wasn't any liquid in the other one. There was a spinning platter and a solid state was no moving parts. And a battery, we're talking about replacing the gel liquid electrolyte with a interface material that is solid. That way there's no liquids um, and it has some pretty good benefits. Commonly, they're going to be ceramic or glass. There's an entire study of different SSB, solid state electrolyte materials. And it's one of the really game changing kind of areas of research. And there's just tons and tons of options and pros and cons. And this is where a lot of the laboratory work is, is happening. So it acts as the electrolyte and the separator, which is cool. So the glass is kind of an insulator in that way. It doesn't allow anything but the ions to pass back and forth. And um, the, the, the presence of a solid state electrolyte means you can keep the dendrites in check and without any liquid, flammable liquid, there's actually a higher decomposition voltage, 4.5 instead of 4.2. That means in the same battery, you can charge it to a higher voltage and have larger amounts of energy. It's naturally flame retardant, not frame. Uh, I didn't see that until just now. And um, even though, Today, we could stack batteries vertically in a car. Uh, it has some challenges because something happened to one of those batteries, the runaway effect of having like a combustion or an explosion would be really catastrophic. So there are, there, it's technically, it's doable to stack batteries today, but the solid state battery would really bring this to the forefront, allow cars and like Tesla semis and huge commercial vehicles to be able to have large amounts of batteries without uh, as much of a risk for runaway thermal events and stuff like that. Next slide. So in theory, if you just kind of broke it down by the material uh, makeup, um, we're talking about like a 10x increase in energy density. Because when you go solid state electrolyte, you can do something like a lithium metal anode, which is as energy dense as you can pretty much get. And by doing so, there's a theoretical 10x improvement, right? My long range Model 3, suddenly goes from 250 to 300 miles to 3,000 miles. So you're going from, instead of like having to stop from here to Northern California, you can drive to Washington DC in one charge. That's game changing. And this is where there's no more conversations. There's no debates like the gasoline car would just be dead. There'd just be no way to compete with something like that. Um, and current breakthroughs and current batteries are getting around 3X or so. So you know, the theoretical, there's there's a long ways to go. Like once the, evolu the revolution happens, then there's gonna be iterative evolutionary steps and we'll get closer to, uh, to that. So why aren't solid state batteries here yet? Clearly they're a good thing um, and they're the next generation of battery, but we've been hearing about this. Like if I asked you guys in the audience, how long have you been hearing about solid state batteries? What would people say? Like five years? 10 years, I don't even, not maybe not 10 years, but for a long time, it's, it's been on this horizon and it's perpetually like a year away for, for far too long. And the reason why is it's, it's actually really difficult to, to pull off. Um, so as, as great as the, the, the benefits are, some of the challenges are that any material, any metal, any, anything on earth will linearly and volumetrically expand and contract based on temperature. So if the battery is charging, like when you first start off, it's you know this length, and then as it charges, it grows and shrinks. And so there's all these thermal cycles. And when you have an electrolyte, no big deal. If you have two two materials that are kind of moving and growing, the liquid in, in the middle will kind of accommodate. And that's the state of the battery today. 
But if you're going to have a solid state electrolyte, something that is sandwiched between these two parts and will still work when all this happens, when the, the temperature in it go, goes up and comes down, that's much trickier. If you've ever seen like a metal under a microscope, as smooth as it might look to you like on the surface, if you got it under a microscope, you would see that it would be very jaggedy and anything but smooth. Um, and that's that microscopic and the effect that you need to have ion like pathways. You have to have enough pathways to make a battery because if the contacts and the amount of ions that can pa pass through a separator and this electrolyte is low, then your battery is going to perform very poorly. You're not going to be able to have very much charge and discharge from it, a low C number, and um, potentially the lifetime might not be as good either. So the first challenge is you have to be able to have a battery that has the performance that you need. And the challenges kind of increase from here, because if you look at uh, the picture on the bottom left, you'll see this kind of sandwich stack of electrolyte, cathode, um, anode, cathode. And so one of the issues in material engineering is the fact that whenever you have like a hard transition, like let's say you have material A and then material B, and they just, there's a hard transition that really inhibits the transfer of ions. It, it makes it much trickier and harder. So the picture on the bottom left, the, the, the picture next to it with the yellow, blue, and red balls, what, they, what they're showing there is some of the techniques and some of the, the, uh, the research that's being done is to introduce the electrolyte material and infuse it into both the anode and the cathode. That way you have more of a gradient rather than like a hard line between material A, the anode, the electrolyte, and the cathode you would introduce some of the materials and the electrolyte into both and allow for a more gradual transition. The picture here of the batteries and these different stack layers, um, you can, if you look at it, the challenges here would be you have the, the bulk, the material, so the current collector or the, in this example, the cathode, the black area. Then you have the surface. Uh, surfaces are where a lot, of, a lot of the oxidation happens and there's other factors at play. Then the surface to the next element, which is the interface, and then the next element, the surface, interface. So all of those areas, you have to have ions that can easily transfer uh, between those, between the two uh, ends of the battery. And this is really hard. Um, next slide. So, you know, when we talk about really hard or, you know, we don't have them yet, there's two categories, nuclear fusion, um, for those, that's what the sun is doing every minute of every day. If we had nuclear fusion on Earth, like energy would be solved. We would all just have free energy for the rest of our lives. Nuclear fusion is not possible. It's physically not possible yet. The temperatures and, and pressures required um, and the energy inputs, we can't do that today. Solid state batteries are possible. We have solid state batteries today. In fact, right now, there are in applications like pacemakers and, and some biomedical devices and stuff. Um, we have them now. It's not that they're physically impossible. The challenge here is one of commercial viability. So it's not enough that you can make one. Can you make them like Tesla's doing at the Gigafactory where they're just getting pumped out at such a scale that they could build 100,000 cars a year. And currently that is where we're all kind of stuck. Um, there's a huge high cost to manufacture so there's a whole new slew of other things that have to happen. Like for example, the material uh, supply chain is different. You need different anode and cathode materials now. You need different just supply chain. The, the machines, the equipment, the manufacturing processes, those are all gonna be different as well. And, and at the end of the day, you have to have a battery that's been proven and tested to be safe and last. So again, you have a solid state battery, you might be able to make one, but again, without any liquid electrolyte, maybe after, 10 charge cycles, something happens and they stop working or some other problem. And until all of that is solved and we have a reliable, repeatable, reproducible battery, um, they're not gonna be ready for large scale applications. So um, a lot of companies talk about this a lot. This, it, it's a really popular thing in the industry to say, oh, we're, we're doing huge things in batteries. Uh, Mercedes-Benz had this concept car at, at CES or some car show. The, the avatar car and they're talking about all this recyclability and all this stuff, but that battery is like 10 years away. Um, more interestingly, Toyota has been talking about a battery they were going to announce at the 2020 Tokyo Games, which is not going to happen now. But even then, they were, the announcement wasn't, hey, we're Toyota, we have a solid state battery and we're making a million EVs a year. It was, hey, here, we're Toyota, here's one car that we can make, 
Toyota can make one cell state battery for a car, um, but we're still not at the point where they can mass produce them. So um, most estimates, most analysts kind of put the, the time horizon at 2025 to 2030 based on how optimistic you are. So they're not, they're not here, they're not happening. Uh, next slide. And this gets us to what I wanna talk about and open up the floor to you guys is, if you think about every company has a decision to make, are we gonna wait or not, right? There's, there's always some, like if you were, if you were uh, Steve Jobs make, at Apple uh, in the age of the iPod, are you going to make a small little platter drive or just say, you know what, let's wait until there's a solid state drive that can hold a thousand songs in your pocket and we'll wait for that technology. They didn't. The first iPod, the big one, had this tiny little platter drive that they worked on. So every com company invariably has this choice as to when do we enter the market? Is it now with limitations and whatever that there might be or do we wait until this ideal time? Um, companies like Honda, Toyota, BMW, who have gasoline cars today, they're not, they don't seem to be that interested in making any kind of a move and building EVs today. Um, my personal take is that Toyota will wait until a solid state battery is commercially viable. And then at that point, they'd consider building EVs. But then there's Tesla who says, we have no other offering. We have no other means of making money. We're making EVs. We're doing it today. We're taking whatever the standard is today. We're going to iterate on it. We're going to improve on it and get started now. And one day when there's solid state batteries, you can believe Tesla will shift their production lines and start building them, but they're not going to wait. And so I think the, the discussion that I wanted to have with the bigger audience today is how this strategy or how this decision is going to fundamentally shape the automotive industry in 10 years. What does it look like? Is it going to be Nikola and Tesla and all these and Fisker and uh, Lucid? Is it going to be all these new startups who, and Rivian? Um, or will the foundational players, the legacy players at Toyota and BMW, will they survive? And I'm curious about what you guys think about that. So that's kind of my presentation. Uh, next slide. Yeah, um, I just want to open it up and, and uh, say thank you for, for uh, listening and for being here today. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. And uh, I'd like to hear what you guys think. Hey, Ricky, it's reaching, <clears throat> reaching fellows. The question I have is um, sometimes in the past, the government uh, has gotten involved in um, putting up dollars for research and development when the cost was too high for um, or to wait around for uh, commercial people to do it. And um, with the green aspects of this, um, you know, is there, uh, what do you think about the prospects of that? Great, great question. Um, I will say, um, I'm trying to stay optimistic. I think we're still doing some cool green initiatives. The, the solar tax credit is still there. I mean, it's kind of getting phased out, but I'm, uh, I don't really know that I, I think that the government is gonna play a big role in this just because there's so much, just lobbying power in like the gasoline industry. There's there's so much power behind not making any moves or making any changes that I think this is going to be one of those situations where um, right now it's still seen as kind of a small thing. But imagine if like all the EVs in the world start to get to 10%, 15% market share. And at some point, every new company is trying to get into the recycling business and the solid state research and development business and people just start getting to every facet of the life cycle of batteries and cars and manufacturing. Um, that will be when we bring prices down and stuff. I think it's gonna be a free market thing. I, I think the, uh, the current administration definitely won't uh, back any sort of uh, moves there. And, but even in general, I think um, this is one of those things when you disrupt the entire world has run on oil for the last hundred years, and we're talking about going away from that. I, I think it's going to be tough, um, but hopefully I'm wrong. And the next administration has some big green initiatives and uh, that does happen. But I think the free market would sort this out even without government um, involvement in the next 10 years or so. Uh, another question really quickly before I uh, was from Mark, who says, are there other battery developments in the pipeline? Um, there are tons and tons of formulations and different iterations on batteries, right? Tesla is supposed to unveil this new battery formulation that they've got that, um, that will be good for maybe closer to three to 4,000 cycles before they degrade. As a result, it'd be good for about a million miles of range. Um, there's also like graphene batteries. Again, graphene would be the replacement on the anode side. Currently we have, we have graphite in the anode. 
Um, Tesla introduces a little bit of silicon as well. Silicon would be far better than graphite. The problem there is expansion and contraction as it charges, which would be very hard to deal with in a battery, but there's some research and stuff happening there. So there's, there's, there's a lot and um, it's every part of the life cycle. It's not just the battery, but like recycling batteries. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of growth and a lot of, a lot of good development, I think. A long time ago, there was a battery called the Ford Sodium Sulfur Battery, which was a solid state electrolyte. And it, um, it looked pretty good for a while. Can you tell me what happened to it? I, I'm, um, I'd have to go back and double check, but I think the issue with the battery you're talking about was just life cycles. I think it, it, um, it degraded pretty quickly for whatever reason, um, as I think the reason. I also don't think the energy density was where it needed to be for like an automotive application. You can, you can think of if like in my, my EV um, to go 300 miles, it cost me a thousand pound, you know, 400 kilogram battery pack. So that really probably is the starting point. We really probably can't afford to have any lower energy density batteries because the weight penalty would just make the automobile um, too compromised. So I think it was either a question of weight energy density or life cycles, I think. But I can double check. I, I don't remember very well, but they were doing it with polycrystalline alumina, uh, beta, sodium beta alumina. And uh, actually- For the electrolyte? Actually produced some, yeah, actually produced some single crystal sodium beta alumina. And then the sulfur and the sodium on, on opposite sides. And the one advantage was we got lots of sodium, we've got lots of sulfur. Yeah, it's pretty right. cheap. And the energy density, as I recall, was actually pretty good with the single crystal version. But I don't it remember sounds... the weight. I think it might have been heavy. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to uh, add it to the list of topics for future videos. But I, it would take a little bit of research on my part, for sure. Oh, no, that's all right. Just an interest. <laughs> Ricky, it's Rob. Um, it's, uh, so the problem with those were they were only rated for about 4,500 cycles. Um, and they lost their efficiency uh, too quickly. The, the drop-off curve on them was such a point that um, it didn't maintain its, its life cycle and the voltage drop-off on it dropped down way too quickly. Uh, that was the main reason why they stopped using those cells. A uh, quick question from Greg was, does it negatively affect batteries to charge it over 80%? So uh, this kind of gets to, yeah, the, you know, the, as the voltage goes up, um, for lithium ion batteries, most well, if anybody who has an EV in the audience um, has today, it would be probably best, best to keep that battery between like 20 and 80% state of charge. Uh, the reason again is as the, um, the voltage increases, the, there's gonna be some expansion in the battery. There's larger uh, chances for degradation, electrolytes forming dendrites and other things. So it does negatively affect the battery, um, but exactly how much is, Kind of a function of which battery and cooling limit uh, cooling uh, performance and things like that but typically for the car batteries that we have today it'd be best to keep them between 20 and 80 percent in a world of solid state batteries that might be different that'd be interesting to, to find out more about but yeah it, it does um it does increase the degradation rate so there's a question i think robert can answer our solid state electrolyte main problem microscopic or macroscopic um, I think it's a little bit of both. There's no clear winner yet in terms of like what sort of material should be used. And I think that's the microscopic issue. Uh, if there's better performance to be had. And I think the, as Robert mentioned, the production part, the macroscopic part is also a challenge probably at this point. And even just, you can just imagine like a glass or a ceramic electrolyte, it would make it very hard to make the 2170 cells that Tesla uses because they're wound in a, in a circle, right? So you might see more pouch and prismatic batteries. And there, there's just a slew of production and engineering challenges that are, are there. Hey, Ricky, do you mind if I just follow up with that real quick? Sure. So the, the problem is definitely on the macroscopic production level um, where you can't reliably produce them in a, in a production level quantity. Um, but at the same time, the also the, the problem is um, keeping the QA in line with the production line um, and actually being able to maintain such a high quantity of uh, high quality of uh, batteries coming on the production line to maintain a solid output. Uh, that's, that's where the two problems come in line, um, especially with solid state with the electrolyte that's being used. 
um, you can source it in small quantities and at good qualities. However, you cannot source it in huge quantities at great qualities, if that makes sense. That's, that's helpful. Next question was, um, is it possible to tell a car to stop charging at 80%? Yeah, I think most cars have that. The, in, in a Tesla, uh, there's a little bar you move. And I have mine set to 80 to 85% day to day. And then if I'm doing a road trip, I'll have it charged to 100%. But I've only done that like twice, I think, since I've owned the car. Um, so what are the advantages of going lithium iron phosphate? Lithium iron phosphate, one of the huge advantages is lifespan. They're, they're really great at, I, I think they can probably last 4,000 cycles before they really have any kind of degradation. They are a little bit less energy dense. Um, so there's that. So there's, that's kind of the trade-off. And typically there's, there's that sort of triangle approach is your cost, performance, and reliability. And you, know, you kind of have to balance those things out. Tesla plan to recycle batteries in their cars. So a former, I forget it's an executive, I uh, forget the gentleman's name, but he was a former, former exec at Tesla. He started a company doing exactly that in the Bay Area where they're gonna recycle batteries. It's gonna be all automated and using machine learning to, to like extract and refine and, and separate the various components and stuff. So I don't think te Tesla has a, a full life cycle approach to battery uh, recycling. But as far as if they're going to contract some of that out, they're probably, they probably will. Um, but that's, that's something I, would, I want to look into more uh, for a future video as well. Uh, could you make a formulation to keep the, the size constant? Uh, no, again, the, just the physics of it, um, the thermodynamics, when something changes temperature, it'll, it'll change size. So you can mitigate and, and kind of control it. There's like, for example, with graphene batteries, they were going to use nanotubes that gave sufficient space for the graphene uh, to, to stretch or the silicon different elements to stretch and move without causing a, uh, a size differential on, the, on, on the, the entire scale of the battery. But, uh, so there's challenges and things you have to solve, but there's probably, there's no real way you can keep size constant as, as temperatures change. Um, car, can't car batteries have a second life in residential load leveling and, and backup? Um, absolutely. Um, Robert and I, so uh, Robert and I were gonna do this EV car conversion project. He came out to San Diego in, in March. Uh, we scrapped it with COVID, uh, we weren't able to do it. But we went to EV West here uh, in Northern San Diego and they have tons of used car batteries and that's exactly, you can use them for whatever you like, power walls or different home things. So even, even when people say, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 cycles, at, at that point, the battery's not like dead, it, it works. It, the, the rating would be after N cycles, let's call it 2,000 cycles, the battery would have 80% of its capacity. So 80% is still great. And at that point, it might be another three, 4,000 cycles, potentially if nothing else goes wrong at that point. So um, it's just like solar panels. Solar panels are rated for 25, 30 years at 80%. But I actually had a commenter once in the video tell me he has panels that are like 40 something years old and they're, they're still rocking along. So that's the point at which they probably each reach 20% uh, degradation and 80% left. But they still would work for home purposes just fine where the density problem is not really a big deal. You have a big garage or a side of the house. Yeah, so yeah, Robert uses Nissan Leaf cells for his motorcycles and his house and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, um, I think uh, the, the big question that I have is really about, I think the solid state battery, if my prediction has always been, is the thing, keeping people on either I'm going to make EVs now or I'm not going to make EVs now. Because it's one of those, fundamental technological breakthroughs that once we have it, um, if you're going to continue to make gas cars, you're going to feel pretty foolish. Um, I don't think it'll make any sense in any, in any way, economically, feasible. it's just not going to make any sense. Until then, you know, you can make arguments and stuff. I still think just how easy to maintain electric vehicle is and how reliable they are. I think they already make sense today, but I can understand why there's a, there's that trade-off today, but that's why we need a, advocacy groups to, to push that. I have some interest in electric airplanes. And uh, can you say a few words about the, because uh, they, they've just been certified in Austria. I wonder if you can say a few words about what you think of the future. Yeah, talk about uh, 
energy density that is as critical as it is for cars, for aircraft, it's everything. Um, a world where we have a 10x battery uh, energy density would be when I think we would see like commercial aviation uh, switch over to, to, to batteries. I think there's already, there, there are planes that fly now, but there's very limited use cases. Like you probably couldn't fill 300 people on an A380 with luggage, like parcels and posts on the bottom and, and, and fly from here to London Heathrow International or something like that currently. And so for that sort of um, adoption into the industry, I think we would need that, that breakthrough, that 10X sort of technology. But I think we'll start to see like maybe the next generation of little Cessnas and things like that, that could be electric and be way more reliable because those engines are not that reliable currently. It's just trying to get a high output from this small single prop piston aircraft is, they're just, that's it's a tr tricky thing. A lot of moving parts and stuff. Hey, hey, Ricky, I got a question for you. Sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for your uh, for your talk. Uh, uh, you know, I was watching a uh, program recently, um, and an expert was talking about um, if we were to electrify half of the motor vehicles on the planet, trucks, cars, everything, that the known supplies of lithium would fall far short. And I'm wondering, um, first of all, is that, is that true? And secondly, if it is, then would recycling uh, help to possibly be the answer for that? Yeah, there's, so lithium is interesting because lithium is incredibly reactive. It oxidizes like instantaneously in air. So you're never gonna like go on a hike and go, oh, there's a huge pile of lithium. It, that never happens. Lithium will just in, instantaneously react. And you've probably seen videos of people who store it in oil and you take it out and it reacts. So when you find lithium, it's usually in like saltwater brine. So um, there's kind of this uh, lithium triangle in South America where most of it comes from now, but our oceans are full of it. So um, in a future where we were desalinating water, we would have like, you could extract salt, you have salt for whatever purpose you need. You can extract lithium from that and 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 clean clean water. So um, there's probably a lot of it. It's a question of cost. Extracting lithium from the ocean is expensive. I mean, it would take a lot of energy input and time and scale to to build and produce lithium. So um, the the numbers that I've seen, uh, I forget. I made a video on this. I, I'll put a link in later. But current reserves, kind of on hand now. Uh, would be enough for, you know, tens of millions of cars and things. Um, and I think the abundance of lithium in the environment is enough to power it all. But the cool thing is when you can go solid state, you have options. You could go with a sodium battery, which I think with IBM and um, I think IBM and Mercedes were working on a partnership with a sodium battery, which um, maybe a little bit heavier than lithium, but has a lot of the same benefits as far as where it is on the periodic table. So, um, and sodium is, is, is very, very abundant. Um, so I think as we uh, have solid state batteries or other breakthroughs, the components that go into the battery might change. But to your second part about recycling, it's absolutely imperative. When these cars currently are kind of come in uh, at the end of their life, 10 years from now, because you can imagine large numbers of EVs in the world haven't been the norm until you know, the last 10 years or so. So in 10, the next five or 10 years, when they're coming in and their end of life, what we do with those batteries is gonna really matter. And again, the free market will, will speak for itself because if going and extracting lithium from the lithium triangle is this expensive, but you have companies, Silicon Valley companies that are coming up online that are all automated and using machine learning to break down current batteries and we can get lithium for this much money, people will buy, buy that. So the cost incentives will be there because I think the business will be there. So um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can get better numbers as far as like exactly how much lithium we have, but I think it's like the seventh most, most abundant element. It's not, it's pretty abundant on, on earth. Yeah. Thank you. Bill, Bill, Bill asked uh, if home batteries could only be used for emergency power and not for nighttime power. Um, it's funny you mentioned that I am getting a Tesla Powerwall installed tomorrow. I've been waiting two years for this. I've been super excited. Yay. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting so long um, for this thing. And it will power my house 
like there's a there's a mode that I can say like balance or cost savings and the cost savings mode you can program it and say I pay really high prices at this period of time 4 to 9 p.m. and at that point in the day when you're using a lot of electricity the power wall will offset it and and use you know you can kind of get your net usage to the utility looking like it's zero even though your house is using power so I don't think that's true but um, the, if if this was true, it would be regulatory. It would be the company saying, like the utility company saying, we don't allow that. We don't allow you to store power and for whatever reason. Um, in California, we're pretty, you know, we're, we're good about that. PG&E and SDG&E is annoying as they are and expensive as they are. They are really friendly to green uh, energy options. But there, there's places like I've, I, have, I have friends in Florida who told me like getting solar in Florida is very tough. Like they don't really want you to do it. And so um, but of course, you could always have like a backup panel and run things off the power wall or some storage battery and the grid would never know about it. So there's there's ways to power your house with batteries and no one can stop you from doing that. Um, you might not be able to export it and get paid for extras, but you could power your house with a battery like for sure. Ricky, this is Simon Friedman. If I may ask a question. Sure. Uh, and first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was wonderfully informative. I've heard so much about solid state batteries and it's always been a bit of a mystery to me. But if I understood your presentation correctly, they actually, we already have them. They're just prohibitively expensive to make. But again, if I understood your presentation, they, they have up to 10 times the capacity of a regular lithium ion battery. So you theoretically could have a car with two or 3,000 miles range. I, I've got sort of a two-part question is, one, sure. do you know how much it would cost to produce this battery that would give a car a 2,000 or 3,000 mile range? And if it is so far advanced, why hasn't one of the legacy automakers, or Tesla for that matter, rolled out a concept car, if you will, to show the masses how far ahead they are of all the competition? Wouldn't that be a great way to boost their own EV green credentials? Yeah, okay, so part one was, um... Yeah. Okay. So, um, so to to make a little battery that you know goes into a pacemaker um, has certain challenges, sure. But you're not wrapping into a big thing. You're not pulling like two C. You know, you're not pulling thousands of kilowatts from it or watts from it um, from each cell. So the challenges are different. I think it's easier to 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 pull off. Plus, you can make a pacemaker and charge a thousand dollars for a pacemaker, and the battery costs. Four hundred dollars or something, uh, you could, it could work out because I mean, in a medical device, what option, what options do you have? In a car, if Tesla would say, "Hey, here's the solid state car. It costs eight hundred thousand dollars, but you can drive to New York," uh, they'd sell a couple. I think there's people would buy them. Um, they're not going to sell hundreds of thousands, but I, they, I mean, they would sell them, right? But um, <laughs> so, but the the cool thing is, they're going to be more expensive up front. At first, they're going to be more expensive. For a while and so what maybe companies will do is have like i don't know like half salt state i don't they'll, they'll figure something out but long term they're going to be way cheaper because just talking like just if we just talk tesla with their their cylindrical cells you have an aluminum casing you have uh you know current collectors you have all these parts that are are there no matter what that aren't adding to the energy they're just the casing or the other parts so if you could put 10 times as much energy into that same casing cost will go down eventually because like material costs are going to be way better in the same footprint of stuff. You can hold more electricity, more, more energy. So cost like 25 years from now, uh, the cost per kilowatt hour is going to be way, way, way less. Um, but to get there, there will be a, a way, just like with lithium ion. When lithium ion first came out in 1980 or uh, around that time, it was way more expensive than the other options. But because of its potential, when it was realized, that's when we got to where we are now, where they're so cheap and, and, and very mass uh, produced. Thank you. And part two, part two was why don't people do So that's what Toyota was planning. Pla Toyota was planning at the Tokyo Olympic Games to come out and say, look at our cool EV that's solid state. It goes so far. Mm -hmm. um, you can't buy one. We're not going to make them for another five or six years because uh, they're not commercially viable. But here it is. We're showing off. That was their plan. Um, I think they'll. I don't know. There's, you know, we're not going to have the Tokyo Games, obviously. So maybe they have like a web webinar or some press event or something. We'll see. But I think they are planning to show off such a thing this year. So, uh, what will Tesla 
cover in their upcoming battery day. I think uh, battery day is going to be all about economics. Um, I think they're going to have, they, I mean, they just, they're, they work on this kind of Silicon Valley model of like, you know, rapid iteration, Kaizen, like they're the model three, you can buy a model three in one year and three people can have different cars because they just keep iterating. Most car companies, they say, all right, pencils down. This is the 2020 model. But Tesla will just roll out features whenever they can. It's a very like Silicon Valley way of thinking about it. Um, so I think their batteries have been kind of the same thing. They're not buying them from somebody. They're, they're, they're doing their own work. So first, of, I think they're going to announce that they're building their own. The Panasonic partnership, I think, will remain intact, just the volume, but that they're going to start building their own in some corner of either Sparks, Nevada or somewhere else. Uh, two is going to be that they've gotten the price per kilowatt hour down or watt hour down to new record lows. And I think three will be that million mile battery, which sounds great, but really all it means is instead of 20% degradation after 1500 charges, charge cycles, it's going to be after 4,000 charge cycles. And we already have batteries that are good for about 4,000 charge cycles. Somebody mentioned lithium iron phosphate. Those are good for about 4,000 cycles today. So it's going to be a combination of those three things, building their own batteries, how they've got the economics of it way down, um, which you notice the model, all the Teslas have just had a price cut of $3,000. And whenever I see that, I keep thinking, I don't think they're giving up their margins because they're still a highly desired car. I think they're showing off their, their prowess of how they're getting the cost down. And battery pack, full pack manufacturing is one of the big costs in these cars. So we can look for that, I think. It'll be fun. I'm looking forward to that event. Sounds like Mark has an LG backup battery. It's awesome. Critical load panel. Yep, I, they, put, they put my critical load panel in. So like AC won't work, the power goes out. AC, my double oven car charger, like the 240 volt charger won't work, but everything else in my house would work in this critical voltage panel. So that part of the, the work was done on Monday. The actual battery goes up uh, tomorrow, but that sounds like Mark has a similar setup. And uh, I like the idea of having that backup of reliance. If some, there's like some emergency or something happens that I'd still have power and, um, I heard that the, the previous president had a, had a, had a son, or had a child or is pregnant expecting, and they thought it was gonna be a big shot to their lives. It's true. Uh, I have a three-year-old and I, I have a two-month-old. And so we now have two refrigerators and there's this, it's the, the logistics of it. It's, um, yeah, I think, I, I hope he's uh, doing well and I hope he's getting a lot of sleep now because it gets very Thank hard. Thank you so much, Ricky. That was awesome. Thank you, Ricky. Um, really Really appreciate you taking your time tonight and um, we learned a lot and we'll definitely check out your uh, YouTube channel, 2-Bit Da Vinci. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you for having me and thanks for all the communication. You've been wonderful and uh, always a pleasure. Thank you guys. Thank you You're all for, for making time today. To I appreciate it.